Are you a writer with a great screenplay just sitting on your desktop? Are you looking for written analysis of your work by experienced creatives? Are you trying to get industry professionals to read your work, but you don't know how to reach them? Then enter the Blue Cat Screenplay Competition. Created by veteran screenwriter Gordon Hoffman, the Blue Cat Screenplay Competition has helped unknown writers launch their professional careers for over 25 years. This year, the Blue Cat Screenwriting Competition will award $18,500 in cash, and everyone who enters will receive written analysis on their work and getting feedback on your screenplay is worth like a lot. The deadline to enter is October 30th, but if you miss it, you could still catch their late deadline on December 11th. Check them out on the social medias at Blue Cat Writers on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So stop waiting to be discovered and send your feature screenplay, TV pilot, and short film script to Blue Cat today. And the deadline to enter is October 30th, but if you miss it, you can still catch their late deadline on December 11th. And you can use our code, all caps, B-C-H-A-R-D-23 for $10 off. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome. This is the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Mark Bussell, the founding host of the podcast. I'm a sci-fi horror filmmaker, and my first feature film, The Alternate, is out now on digital and DVD. Why don't you give it a rating on uh, IMDb? That'd be great. (laughs) You should do it. I'm Liz Manischel. I'm a writer, director, producer who has made two features, Bread and Butter and Speed of Life. And I'm currently in development on my first horror feature, Best Friends Forever. I'm a distribution consultant who does sales, and I used to manage Sundance's creative distribution initiative. This week, we welcome writer-director Nyla E. Nook Shook to talk about her film Slashback, which won the Grand Jury Prize at South by Southwest this year. Holy shit. And she talks about making a sci-fi alien invasion feature in a completely remote town and how it's led to the funding of her second feature already, which is extremely exciting. As we recorded this interview when she was at Stigis, another like bucket list thing for me as a filmmaker. So she's living the dream. And also, I got to watch the whole movie. It was very good. So like, it's really fun to watch a movie that you like and to see it be doing well for somebody. It's like the double, double dip. After that, we play another round of The Game. But first, Liz, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderfully. I already talked about it a little bit in our staff meeting, but anytime your kid gets sick, you're going to get it too, right? Or at least the way I ingest germs, I definitely get it. And <laughs> I got hand, foot, mouth, which is the most absurdly named virus of all time. And I got it way worse than my son did. I got these massive red sores and blisters over my hands oh. and my feet, and I couldn't move my hands, and I couldn't <laughs> stand or walk. And it oh coincided with my screening at Screamfest. So I couldn't go see my movie play at Screamfest, which was a very, very big deal to me because Screamfest oh, to man. me was like, remember when I got into Screamfest and I was like, I'm a genre filmmaker. Someone in the genre world wants me. Yeah. So I was looking forward to Screamfest for the past four months. <laughs> so sad the way I'm describing it. Oh, man. But what was really great is that actually a lot of my cast and my crew showed up to the screening and my EP secretly recorded the screening and I got to hear everyone's audible reactions to the wow. film. So I, cool. it was like I was there. It was so that's what's going on with me is that the sun is shining. The sky is blue. Life is so much better when you don't have hand, foot, mouth. Wow. I didn't know hand, foot, mouth was a real disease. That's <laughs> crazy. I thought it was just like a joke. It sounds like a joke. It's that like, <laughs> why Why can't you come up with a better name than hand, foot, yeah. mouth? Like, you can't, can it just be red, red, red spot disease? That would be better. <laughs> well, it's also, it's very descriptive. It's like you touch your hand, you touch your foot, you touch your mouth, and then you got sick. <laughs> And poor, I'm really glad that I got the brunt of it. My son just got a fever and like was a little sneezy, but I got like, like you can't, you, I don't think you could see them anymore, but I had spots all over my face, my nose, oh, my man. mouth. Rough. It was very traumatic, but life is better now. How are you? I'm um, okay. Yeah. I'm bummed that you didn't get to go to Scream Fest. I saw that on your Twitter. I was like, what? And then I remember that you were feeling sick. I was like, oh no, she's probably just really sick. And I was like, damn, that sucks. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah. But, uh, you know, life goes on. It's You still yeah. got your movie played at Scream Fest, which is yeah. like super, super cool. I've really wanted to play there for a while. And then like, I, I don't know if we probably talked about it in the podcast, but I got into Downstairs with Films last year. Right. You, you did talk about this. Yes. And then I had to like 
you know, back off from Screamfest, which I think was a good chant call because who knows if I would have gotten into Screamfest. But I did get into dances, so. But they both play at the same place, right? Same theater. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, they're very sweet at dances and they have an open bar and it was really fun. So good, good, good times. Yeah, I'm okay. You know, we're, we're, our casting director is doing her thing this week. So that's very exciting. We're approaching these actors and just trying to, it's basically like an availability check and a gauging interest and then to try to see if like, the the rate we have in mind is correct for them you know if it's like in the in the right ballpark so I, it's a very delicate dance it, it sounds like yeah. but she's you know got a lot of connections and she's been doing it for a long time i think she's casted uh, casted like 10 to 12 movies or something so like i feel like she's gonna do a good job Wait, on that note, I was talking because I'm helping produce Kyle Hausman Stokes first feature and his casting director was saying that you used to be able to ask what the actor's last rate was, what their rate Uh is. And they don't let you do that anymore. But that used to be common practice. So you didn't you wouldn't have needed to do this thing that you're doing right now. This kind of like sneaky research thing. Yeah. Like, is this going to be okay? You know, because apparently this is like the thing. If you get it wrong. Like you could like basically end up killing the project because if you get the distributor excited about an actor, but then you can't afford them and then you can't afford anyone similar to them, you know, there's no one that they'll accept that you can afford. Basically, they're like, oh, no one's as good as X. It's like, you know, then they'll just lose interest and then it just goes away, you know. So we're just we're basically trying to do enough research and enough work and like give enough names that the distributors like so that we have like so many options to fall back on if we can't secure one of the the, the top names that we have. Oh, yeah. So we'll see how it works. And it's exciting. You know, this whole process, the way they want to do it is to like get it ready for AFM so they can pitch at AFM with these 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 meetings and then like hopefully have a deal out of AFM. So we'll, we'll see. I don't know. It's all crazy. It's like the same weekend that we're going to be at Austin. This all happens. So. Well, AFM is November, right? So it's slightly right after. Yeah. It's like right around the same time. I think you might even be going out to LA earlier for meetings, Mm -hmm. you know, before Mm -hmm. that. I'm not sure, but it's, it's all in the same week span or something. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. So very exciting stuff. Yeah. So that's, that's all I should be writing, not writing. I should be running more Facebook ads for my movie. I ran one. Well, I have two now. Two total. Oh, I've been on the receiving end of at least one of those. It's yeah. like I scroll down my feed and I see this sponsored ad. And I was like, why am I? Of course. Like, you shouldn't go for me. I'm um, like, I'm easy. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like attacking people in like, you know, like Austin and like New York and, you know, whatever. I don't know why. You're oh, maybe it was, it, you're not doing L.A.? Interesting. In L.A. In LA too. That's you know? why. That's why. Though. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I wish you because you've already seen it. So I don't know. I guess it's, it's just not how it works. It's not like you can't. They don't target people who've already, you know, follow it. Well, if you are specifically targeting people who've already engaged with your content, then it would make sense that I would be served to that ad. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Interesting. But like, don't don't waste your money on me, but I'll click it if that helps you. Do you want me to? I'll click some <laughs> things for you. I'll do clicking. Always clicking is always good. Clicking yeah. is great. I wonder if you'll see the next one. We'll see. I'll try to to mix things up. See what happens. Yeah. But yeah, no, I don't know. Nothing exciting. I mean, the movie's exciting. I mean, also, am I reading a script right now? I should be. I think I have like two that I should be reading. I'm not. I'm reading a documentary. Uh, not a documentary. Is a book called a documentary? No. <laughs> I'm reading a book, a biography. It's not really a biography. It's a it's a book about the making of Bonfire of the Vanities. I don't know if you know of this movie. Yeah, yeah. Sean listened to the podcast about the making of Bonfire of the Vanities that they did last year. It was amazing, he said. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the it's that's like the same person. It's like she did like the the, the long podcast version of the book. And so Beth listened to that and then she read the book and then now I'm reading <sighs> the book. And it's really great. It makes that D- D- Brian De Palma not look very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I was talking to someone the other day and he's like, you guys say a lot of things on your podcast that you shouldn't say. So I just curbed <laughs> myself from saying something about Brian De Palma. 
Talented filmmaker. Talented filmmaker. I will say that. Yeah. It's just funny because it's like, I know that he invited her to be on the set. So like, he, like her being there was like his idea, you know, partially. And so, you know, she just like was really ruthless against him and, and Bruce Willis too. She really rips mm. into Bruce Willis nice. about, you know, really rough. Anyways, movie making is interesting. It's crazy to like see it on a such a big le- level at a time when things were like, so different than they are now, you know, it's just like, you know, the amount of money they were spending, the the perception, the way the whole business is just so different than it is now, you know. So, yeah, very fascinating. But what is also very fascinating is our Patreon page. You can check us out at patreon.com slash MMIH podcast. This is one of the ways the show stays afloat. So if you go there, give a dollar, or if you give $2, you'll actually get access to all the back episodes of the show, which is an increasing list. I actually put like another 10, 20 episodes in the back catalog last week. So yeah, if you're a completionist and you're just finding the show now, you won't be able to hear all the episodes unless you become a Patreon member. So check that out. We also, we put our weekly staff meetings with our good old pal, our friend, Eric, our producer, you know, Eric Toms comes on there and has many funny things that make me laugh. So if you want to get a little behind the scenes of the show, that's one of the things that we do. I also post videos, Liz posts videos, and there will be b- bonus episodes coming. Liz has posted one video. Yeah. I've posted like four, maybe five. If anyone requests a video, if anyone has special interest in me doing a video, I will do one. But uh, unless I set a demand, Ooh. I'm probably going to hold off on another video. It should be Liz's daily distribution tips. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> We tried that once at the podcast, right? We had like a segment and I like ran out of things Uh, to say after like three episodes. Four four times and you're like, I'm done with this. This is over. Yeah. 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 Also, another thing that's really good to do after you check out the Patreon page is to check out the International Screenwriters Association, the ISA. They are an organization designed to connect writers with filmmakers through a number of programs they offer, consultation courses, contests, and their top 25 writers list. So head over to www.networkisa.org to sign up for free today. Finally, we will be at Austin Film Festival on October 28th through the 30th. So let us know if you want to meet up. We're there to interview Craig Mazin, which is very exciting. Also, Liz will be monitoring the writing to production panel Saturday morning at 8, 9 a.m. I was not invited, so I'm going to show up anyways. It'll be great. <laughs> I'll be there as a fan to support and to ask questions. But, you know, it seems like a really cool panel. I don't know what else I'm going to do this whole weekend. I, I'm just going to hang out. I'm going to be there. Maybe see some movies. It's going to be fun. I was thinking, like, let's like let's go to movies and then let's, like, go yeah. meet up with people. I think that would be a lot of fun. Let's network. I want to meet as many filmmakers as possible. Yeah. Because new filmmakers that I don't know are great people to meet. So... Yeah, if you want to say what's up, just, you know, you know how to reach us. Podcast, email, Twitter, Facebook, all the places. But anyways, without any more further gobbledygook, here's our chat with Nyla Enoch Shook. Do you mind giving us the elevator pitch for Slash? <laughs> sure. I mean, the main concept w- that I originally had was just a movie about a group of teenage girls in this remote Arctic community that that take on an alien invasion. That's so cool. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) How long did you shoot the film? We shot it over a couple of months. I think that we initially had 27 shoot days scheduled on the books and that changed a little. We added a few, but it was it was filmed over about two months in the community of Peng. What was the budget or what can you say with regard to the budget? I can say that it was a indie Canadian budget. <laughs> That it was small that we were figuring out. I mean, this was the the first movie I made as a director. And so it was just a million lessons a day. I felt like I was learning and it was like I was getting on the plane to leave Pang. And I was just thinking to myself, okay, I feel like that's how you make a movie. I feel like I'm ready now that I now that I know. But it was like we just finished finished shooting. And so now I I feel like 
I, I couldn't have chosen a more ambitious project for my first feature, but it, I, it was also, you know, so great to be, to be having it as a first experience to really be learning so many lessons along the way. And then obviously working with, because the first time director and a cast that had never acted before trying to finance a movie like that was tough. It was, it was really hard, but we, but, but we had a great team. My producers were fantastic and we just, and, and then we had to get really creative about how we made a project on a on a budget like the one we had. And and it was really important to me early on that we film in the community to film in a community like Peng. The Arctic is it has a quite a few communities in it. Khaluit is the capital city. And so that kind of there have been movies that have been shot in a Khaluit before. It's not a big city, it's 7,000 people, so it's still this t- kind of a small town, but it, the the dynamics of the the city are just so different than these communities, these flying communities that kind of are are more spread out throughout the Arctic. And for myself, I'm from a community like that at Glulik, similar in size to Peng, about 1500 people, but it's very flat. It's beautiful. It's, it's an island, but I've, I'd shot in Peng before a documentary about the tradition of square dancing that exists there and totally fell in love with that place my nephews are from there. So even when we were kind of figuring out how to logistically figure this out, we knew kind of going to a remote community like this was just going to be an added challenge. And and it's expensive to get people there as well. I went to the principals of the high school and the grade school and basically asked them, told them we needed a place to live for the summer in, in order to make the movie. And they basically let us move in to the schools because the community itself also just doesn't have the housing to to support the community that lives there, let alone a crew that's coming in for the summer. So we turned all the classrooms into bedrooms for cast and crew. We shipped up beds and we turned every classroom into everybody had a roommate. So you were staying with someone else in a classroom and 24 hour sunlight. So we had to black out all the windows in the classes, but we wouldn't have been able to to do it if, if we didn't have people helping us out in town like that and and, and really kind of being creative with with how we figured out how to how to get this done. So you, I answered a lot of questions in that one answer, but <laughs> the next question is how, how did you come up with the idea for the movie originally? To be honest, I can't even tell you when I came up with it. I feel like I've I've always am coming up with ideas for movies and it, but I always knew that this one was something that people were responding to teenage girls fighting aliens and, and from a remote place like this. So it was something that I had kind of really been thinking about for a while. And for myself, I got into movies as a fan first, really just watching movies as a kid and horror specifically, you know, I, I loved movies like Goonies and E.T. and Indiana Jones and stuff. Star Wars and the idea of making a movie that was this kind of adventure coming of age movie but set in a place that was familiar to me was just something that that seemed like a lot of fun and and my nephews are five and seven years old and they're from the community of Peng so this idea of making an alien invasion movie that's set in their hometown was something that was kind of special to me. And I know there's not like a distinct moment where you came up with the idea, but can you chart how long you've been working on the film from approximately that time until now? Yeah, well, I, I've actually been working with some of the cast members since about 2017. So five or six years now. So I developed it first as a proof of concept, a short film, knowing that I we were all so green going into this that we I decided to shoot the proof of concept to give a sense of tone and style and in that process I did some acting workshops with a local theater actor named Christine Tutu who worked in our props department in the end I worked with Christine to have acting workshops with young people young women specifically youth who are just interested in coming out and, and hanging out and we did some some workshops but then in that process had some sides from the proof of concept and we're testing out different groups of girls with each other and ended up casting that way 
And so in that process, I met Alexis, who plays Jesse, and Chelsea, who plays Lena, Nala Joss, who plays Uchi. So we made, we made that short film. And then once we got our producing team on board and I was able to finally find Ryan Cabin, my co-writer, and we started working on the script together, in Nunavut, we spent a lot of time hanging out with, with some of the kids. We would go out boating, go to cabins, just watch scary movies. <laughs> and by this point, I'd already made a short film with them. And so they also kind of in- influenced this, the script and the characters. While we also kind of drew from my own inspiration, being a, a young person in Nunavut, figuring out where I fit in and how my enoughness fit into that. So it's, I think, you know, really kind of been working with this, this cast for about five Five years and developing it it seriously with them and so to see them almost grow up with the movie we're in spain together right now showing the movie here at sitches and just being able to to see them alexis is getting ready to write her pilot's exam to like fly planes there it's like really it's so cool to and some of them are you know a lot of them are in their final year of high school knowledge us has just started a new school so it's so great to just to see how they're growing up, but then also see them being really proud of representing the movie and sharing it with audiences and sharing where they come from with audiences. And then compared to all the other projects you've made, how difficult was it to make this movie? Mm. It was so hard. (laughs) It was so hard to make. Like in a way it was like, I I needed to be doing this. And, And so it's, it, for some people, I think, I mean, I think it's just crazy to go into this industry and this, it, it choose this as kind of a career path, but some people just need to do it. So they should. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, I kind of felt like that. I wasn't, uh, I actually had gotten quite sick at a certain point and I was writing, I, I had this idea for the movie and was initially pitching it as a writer and producer. And I was going to get someone else to direct it and I thought that it was maybe too well rightfully so that it was maybe a little ambitious and but then i got sick and realized what am i doing i I, this is really important to me this is my movie so if i get better i'm gonna make it and luckily at the time my producer was totally on board with that and so so we made a change of plans i ended up actually getting a liver transplant and four months later is when i shot the proof of concept Wow. (laughs) So, you know, it was kind of this thing where it was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be really hard, but I've done hard stuff. I've just done this really hard thing. And, and so we can, we can take this on. And it, so it really is kind of crazy to me that one of the scariest things was actually saying, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. And that there must have been something that was keeping me from 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 doing it. But then, and 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 I hope that it doesn't take it at other people. You know, this extreme kind of thing to shock you into. But I but I think you know it is important to remember that that life is short. That that we should be doing what we love and and yeah, trying to do things that we're passionate about. I love that making movies is hard, but maybe not as hard as a liver transplant. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thinking about the process of the. Way way the Canadian film industry works versus the U.S. American film industry works, you know, just doing very cursory research on on this project so far. You know, I'm assuming I know you went to markets. I, I assume labs were part of that. Can you talk a little bit about the pitch? You know, it's your first directorial debut as as a feature project. And obviously, you go to painstaking lengths to make it authentic. Did the sci-fi nature of it, was that the slam dunk that people came on board for? Or what do you think drew people on board the project? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think that definitely the genre, the familiarity of the genre was something that was interesting to people. I also, sorry, I, I'm kind of emotional. I just found out about the passing of another director, Jeff Barnaby, um, oh. from cancer. And he, he had just made a movie, Blood Quantum, that had come out. He had yeah. filmed it the same year that I shot Slashback. And Dennis Goulet, who's a good friend of ours, had shot Night Raiders the same year. And so it was just really exciting for us to be to be making things and and feeling like we were doing something that was a little bit different that and Jeff is someone who like me was 
really kind of got into movies is uh, not not necessarily to try and tell our culture stories. We got into it because we love movies and we love getting scared. And, and so to try and find that balance of how can we do something that's really fun, but then also feels authentic to us and from a place. And I think that that's kind of what we were able to do. And, and being able to work with the, the amazing cast is in the process of writing the script, it was just really special because they, you know, we, you, you, you th- these are girls that are connected to the tradition, but then are also very much modern girls that we would, they would just talk to us for hours and hours about boys and the drama of the, everything that's going on in their teenage life. And so, you know, being able to say like, oh, this is going to be really fun. And for us, it was trying to make something that was a fun alien invasion movie first. And then I, I knowing that knowing as an indigenous director with an indigenous cast that people would be placing this this narrative of the colonization, this indigenous community facing an invading threat. That would be something that would be placed on it already, this uh, this larger meaning. So for us to kind of nod to that would almost feel heavy handed. So really trying to place it in this like fun, a fun place that a fun experience that can be empowering for our communities and and show it show a different side of us was was something that was exciting to me. And it was also so encouraging to see from from fellow filmmakers and people that I could talk to for advice. And so I really appreciate that. So can you talk about like how important the proof of concept was in order to get the feature made? Like, was it kind of like if you didn't do that, the whole thing wouldn't happen? Like, or was it something that you needed to do as yourself as a filmmaker to know that you could make this kind of movie? Or like, just talk about how that kind of played into, you know, getting the movie off the ground. Yeah, I think it was so critical in getting it off the ground. And if there's anyone who's maybe not directed before is got an idea and is trying to get it off the ground, developing it as a short or in another iteration of it, I think is a really good idea. And so I'm always trying to figure out how do I get more experience directing things? And, and uh, I just felt like every day was I was learning a million lessons, like jumping into freezing cold water and seeing if I could swim. And at the end of the day, being like, I guess we'll do that again and it was like how can i make sure i'm never in that position again like how can we be taking all these lessons and and trying to get better and and it's been really great with the talking with our cast too and like the, the, we all were learning so much in the process of making this spending more time exploring and and figuring out ideas if you can that's so great and i also as someone i i love interactive media virtual reality augmented reality video games and that sort of thing and so I love the idea of being able to sit sit with ideas in a, a little bit longer and thinking about those concepts in maybe a different form. I also love comic books and do some writing of comic books. So it's sometimes fun just to be oh, like how... It, because it is such a different way of, of thinking of telling a story of, of how does it fit within a panel or using the turn of the page is really the only kind of device that the, the audience has. And, and so it's it, being able to to sit with characters and themes. I think if, if it's a space you love, then just to, a, a way to kind of figure out some of these things for yourself. I also, I think that because there wasn't a ton of precedent to be like, oh yeah, this is like this movie or, and the fact that I hadn't directed anything before. I think it was really important for me to to do that because the, the we had the pitch deck and and this little video at first, and then luckily eventually we had the script. Which I mean, then that kind of can do a bulk of the of the work for you. But yeah, it was it was. I think it was really great to do that exploration with the with the proof of concept, and it gave me more time to work with the cast as well. I've got another feature that I've that I've written and plan to shoot next year. But I'm already thinking like, maybe I do a little short thing ahead of time, even just with because, you know, I think that it's like you're wanting there. Every project will be every project will be different. And you're you might be working with different people and and figuring out those relationships and dynamics of how that works or if it will work. So, yeah, I'm I'm definitely curious about continuing that kind of thing. If if if, if, I mean, if there's room or time that's available for that kind of thing. I wanted to talk a little bit about your 360 filmmaking, your VR. I mean, I, I saw this on your website that you're developing a short horror film that will be shot with eight cameras at once and be displayed on a 270 degree 
2024K screen at 2022 Venice Biennale. I just had to mention that because I just think that's incredibly noteworthy. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm usually the one with the longer questions that are really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about like how a lot of filmmakers I know are obsessed with getting funded and they're like nose to the ground, like just got to keep plugging away to get the features out. But you are exploring different modes of interactive storytelling yeah. at the same time. Can you talk a little bit about that as a strategy or is it just you're going to where your heart wants you to go? Yeah, I think it's more about going, going, doing what I want to be doing. Because I think that I used to be a little overly ambitious and put a lot of pressure on myself. And when you work in these new technologies and video games and in VR, it's kind of like this idea that if uh, you know, you're kind of like wanting to do all these things because it's like an opportunity to maybe be the first person to do this thing. And it can kind of get, you know, and you, you can get into this mindset of like, where you're almost bragging about how little sleep you get and hustle culture, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and for me, especially after I got sick, it really shifted things for me. I realized like, oh, all of these things that I thought were so important that were like all this pressure I put on these things, like none of it matters. Are you telling me like it was kind of this thing where like, oh, like it truly none of it matters. I, I And at the time I had been given a 50-50 chance of surviving the month when I first got sick. And so mm. it was this kind of shocking thing of being like, oh, well, what is important? And what's a, what makes a happy life? And, and certainly it's, you know, achievements and all of that stuff. They, it, 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 when it comes down to it, it isn't important at all. It's like the people that that are in your life. It's the relationships. It's and so for me, it's it's been so wonderful. Also, just that I I'm I work up as part of the Indigenous Screen Community, which is close knit. And in Toronto, there's the Imaginative Film Festival and lots of uh, filmmakers that I can talk to and and that we for years have been really talking about these ideas of authentic representation, narrative screen sovereignty, the importance of having our stories being told by us. And then in re the recent years, this switch where now all of a sudden people are starting to say those things and, and know what they mean. And it's an exciting time to kind of be, to be making things. And so I have, I've once again, totally let the question get away with me. But you, but it's gold still. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's not <laughs> like... <I'm tired. laughs> it's fine. Okay, so I wanted to talk about a little bit more process-based question here. Just because I, I, I haven't finished your movie yet. I'm in the middle of watching it. My daughter needed my attention. <laughs> but it's very great Fair. so far. I, lo I love it. it. It feels like this movie, in a lot of ways, is made for genre fans. Because it's just like you hit all the, 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 the beats and, you know, the love that you put into the creature work. And the special effects I've seen so far is really amazing. But the question is, making a movie like this in a place like this, completely remote, out, out of touch with, like, you know you know, a big city or anything, what yeah. were some of the challenges you faced, you know, with the special effects and making a genre movie in a place like this? Yeah, it was really crazy. We kind of treat it because we were going to such a remote place. It was fly in only really expensive to get to. We couldn't afford for people to be taking multiple trips back and forth. So it was kind of, we were treating it like we're making a movie on a cruise ship. We have to make sure everything's on the ship because once we're out there, there's nothing we have to, everything has to be on board. I mean, one of the things that came up right away was we ordered all of this blood, vats of blood from this special blood place in LA. And so we had this blood shipped up to Nunavut from California and it was, it came in these huge tubs and it was like unicorn purple <laughs> it was so bright oh and i was just like oh no i do not think this is gonna work and so we luckily were living in a school so we had wood like the wood shop and all their paint supplies and all of this stuff so we're like when we had to like make adjustments to weapons or in this case change the color of blood we, we had some <laughs> materials to play around with i love that you seen like finger paints to adjust it in some way. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, it was so crazy. It, it was also just uh, it was a lot of fun to to figure out a lot of that stuff. And we got to work with this amazing contortionist who would wear these 
skin suits that we would make. And even just Troy was like a, a hero around town because all the kids were so amazed by what he was able to do with his body. They would just follow him around and at one point, the town has a, a special music fest that happens every summer. And they had Troy come out and perform for them and, and freak out all the kids. <laughs> oh, Amazing. I forgot to prepare a question. I was just enjoying that story <laughs> so much. <laughs> oh, can you just tell us a little bit about the future of your company, Mixtape VR? Like, I'm just curious about why you formed the company and, and what other projects we might not be aware of that you might want to talk about. Yeah. Well, I've got another feature script. It's a psychological thriller, a little my adult horror movie, (laughs) I'm calling it. And it's another movie that's, I think, super personal to me. I think really fun and scary. It's called In the Heart of the South. So it's set down south. In Nunavut, basically, anywhere that's not the Arctic is down south. (laughs) So Winnipeg is down south. Toronto is down south. So I'm really looking forward to that. Really looking forward to kind of taking everything I've learned. and, And like I said, just try and get better. My cinematographer said this thing to me. You know, you you can't expect to get like you're never gonna get uh, to be, can, you're never gonna get perfect, but it's like maybe every movie you can get better by half. It's like you get it halfway closer, and then you know the steps get you, you're make the steps feel less dramatic as you're getting closer towards being the filmmaker that you want to be. And so you know, I, I'm just hoping to continue to be able to make things, and and I'm still very curious about the the, the piece that I shot for the Venice Biennale was just such a blast to make that uh, I mean I'm curious about exploring that in in 2D form to just like regular movie I mean (laughs) and then my co-writer Ryan Cavan and I have a couple of projects that we're developing as well just that are fun and have monsters and scary things (laughs) so this movie is a a pretty great achievement I mean you you won the grand jury prize at South by Southwest you're at Stitches right now it's like one of the best like you know genre film festivals in the world if not the best what has this movie done for your life since you've finished it like what has it been a big life change for you already or is that still in process like what has the impact been on your your you know life as a filmmaker yeah well I mean for me I didn't I couldn't call myself a filmmaker before I couldn't call myself a director because I hadn't directed anything uh, it definitely has for me just I mean you know you you work so hard and then and you're all I feel like you're always hustling so much to kind of get things to get things made and fighting for to do just like kind of the smallest to show that you can do just the smallest amount. And then actually at South by, I got some support. We've got this great office here called the Indigenous Screen Office in Canada. And they actually provide funds towards features. And uh, the Canadian system is kind of great in that we can get movies financed for, uh, you know, about the 80% funded with Canadian funds. And then you have to try and find, find the rest. But with organizations like the Indigenous a screen office that are able to just come in and give some some funds first in and just show support for the project it kind of it makes all the difference and and makes that gap financing a lot less scary it, when i was at south by i actually found out that they were giving support towards my second feature and i don't think i'd really realized i was like that like even though i was actively i had another script and uh, the idea was to to make it to soon, I, I hadn't really let it uh, sink in that this was um, now something I could do as a job, that this could could kind of be my career. And then to find out like, oh, yeah, this is this is a movie that now is is going to get made. And and that can that it was after, you know, what is it would have been a real challenge to kind of be able to take a bit of a, a breath and and start to think about the work and the creative work and and not not have to also be working other jobs and and doing all of these other kind of smaller projects on the side to kind of make it happen. I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, I guess just more specific on that. So you talked about like getting the funding for your next feature. Did you also get a representation out of this process? Is that 
part of this or yeah. is that something that you're still working on? Yeah, I I started working with my agents at UTA and that came out of this process and that's been really great. I also had briefly <laughs> worked with a Canadian agent and I mean, he was a, a sweet person, but I just realized it's the the industries are so are so different and the Canadian the, the relationship Canada has with its indigenous people is is really kind of interesting. So the, the kind of stuff that I was getting within Canada was really frustrating and it felt like a, a bit tokenizing. And so it's mm. been kind of an interesting shift working with American representation, but it's been really, it's been really great. And so I've been reading some things, but then also of course, work, to, working to, to kind of get my own stuff out there too. Okay. Well, here, I'm going to go into our final six questions just because this might take us a minute. What's the first film you made and how do you feel about it now? It sounds like this might be your first film or maybe the yeah. concept, but feel free to answer that any way you'd like. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then, I mean, if with Slashback, it has been really complicated. I mean, when I first saw the rough assembly, I was like, what have I done? <laughs> I have wasted <laughs> everyone's time and money. And, uh, but luckily one of my producers gave me a call and was like, this is what, this is how it goes. And he was like, there's a movie <laughs> in here. And uh, I would, would talk to my other friend, Zoe Hopkins, who's this amazing filmmaker. She made a movie called Run, Woman, Run, which is kind of this rom-com set on the res. And so she's uh, someone who's kind of making things that maybe are fall outside of what people are used to watching when they watch Indigenous cinema. Emma. It's it's just been kind of great to get her perspective and and see her as a filmmaker grow with her projects. And same with Janice Goulet, actually, who's who directed Night Raiders, and then she directed her second feature, which was a Netflix movie, and then and then directed an episode of um, Reservation Dogs. And so hearing her talk about the d this kind of learning curve and the, this feeling like everything is just so insane on this first movie and then you know in the second one she still was like learning so much but by the time she got onto to reservation dogs she was like comfortable and confident and was like i know how to do this and even just hearing that from danis it makes it feel like okay if she's gone through this it's like it, then you know it, this is a this is kind of a normal process but kind of going through this thing of of really feeling like you're putting everything into this thing and then at the end just being like oh that's it <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then having to like it, it's been this kind of emotional roller coaster for me but it's i'm so proud of what we did and it's been so great to have the this teenage cast alongside me because it has been just the greatest gift to watch them grow up with the movie, see them find their pride in themselves and where they come from, just and, you know, being here in, in Spain with them and and seeing how happy they are to share the movie and to talk with audiences about what it means to them and what their community and culture means to them and being really proud as they talk about it. It's just been the greatest thing for me to watch and, and has made this whole thing feel completely worth it for me. Awesome. What's the best filmmaking advice you've ever received? Hmm. You know, one, uh, right before I was shooting, my producer had been working with Vigo on his Vigo Mortensen on his first feature. And I had sat on a board with, with Vigo and I asked him like, what's the advice you can give me? And he just said, be so picky about your heads of department. I think that actually it, it's, it's so interesting and I think that I'm pretty collaborative in the way I work. And I think what's so great about making movies is you get this opportunity to work with so many amazingly talented creative people that are just kind of experts at what they do. And they spend all their time thinking about costume or production design and to be able to get to work with all of these amazingly collaborative people, but also in the direction of what you want. It's so great because, I mean, you don't have to know everything. You have to know a lot and have to have the answers and the story, but then you'll get to work with these really creative, collaborative people. And but the one thing for me that I didn't realize and I wish I'd known is that that basically kind of is so much of the job is actually managing people 
And it was something that I just, I wasn't quite prepared for. And it was like, I got back and I was like, I'm going to talk to my therapist about how we can build up my patience and, and really be like, because it, it's, it's the, uh, as an introvert also, it's just the idea of that this is a, a team sport. And so you're in it with people for however the, the the time it is that you're making this movie and that it's it, it, that all of that is kind of emotional work and what it's what makes it so rewarding but it is also a challenge for sure okay and then what's the worst filming advice you've ever received huh oh i once was told that it was important for me to explain to broadcasters that in indigenous story telling things are going to be very slow paced <laughs> And that there are no antagonists in Indigenous stories. <laughs> and I was like, excuse me. Yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting one. Wow, wow, crazy. And then last question, is making movies hard? Making movies is so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, tell everyone where they can see the movie. Like, how can we find the movie, watch the movie and support who's a filmmaker? Yeah, the movie is going to be on demand and on digital and VOD October 21st in the US and will be released later on Shutter. Amazing. Well, I can't wait to start seeing the praises of your movie. I can't wait to finish it. Congratulations. And I can't wait to see, wait to see what yeah. you make next. Thanks so much. Liz, what do you remember about our talk with Nyla? I just, it's one of those calls where, or conversations where you're just like, oh, I just really like this person. I like, I, I fall into love with some of our, the people we interview just because they have such a lovely attitude because I, there's something about them where I feel like, oh, I, uh, they have a commanding, interesting vision and I, I, I want to see where their career goes. I was just kind of like enamored by by her and the way she described how she works in the industry. Like just the fact that she spent so much time in development was really exciting. You know, her love for genre film was incredibly apparent. Like you could just see it in her her eyes when she started talking about the movies that she loves. So uh, what I remember, I just remember it being lovely. I remember having to leave early. I remember it being a little rushed <laughs> and that I... I root for her, you know? What do you remember? Oh, yeah. Well, I remember that we were, like, getting a peek into this person's world when, like, the most exciting thing was happening mm -hmm. to her in her movie. Like, you know, being at Stigis with her, her cast and crew, you know, to watch the movie at that festival and to support it. Like, that's got to be one of the most amazing things ever. I mean, she already won the Grand Jury Prize at South by Southwest earlier this year. So, it's like, just looking at somebody who's kind of, like, on the top of the world, you know, and, like, handling it extremely well, you know, and just being super wonderful and awesome. Awesome and, you know, really excited about what this means for her future as a filmmaker and yeah. getting to make her second feature. I just thought she was super awesome, super classy and, you know, very, just very excited for her as a filmmaker in general. It was just really fun to talk to her. And I had seen about half her movie at the time that we talked. So mm -hmm. I was like in the middle of like this really awesome experience watching her movie, which like now I, I have to watch again. I'm like, man, this, this is great that it was a sci-fi movie. Cause that's like my type of movie. And I love these movies. But if this had just been a story about these characters and there hadn't have been an alien invasion plot, this movie would still be super good and still <laughs> be like really successful, you know? So it's kind of amazing that it's like, yeah, like I can imagine the indie drama version of this movie like being a hit and then but the sci-fi, you know, action, you know, whatever invasion movie version of this movie was like even better, you know? So, you know, it's really about the characters, like the, the time she spent with those actors, like, you know, and getting getting their performances down and getting to know them and writing them, you know, in, in the way that fit them as people and as actors, like that was really amazing work because like it just these people, it just <laughs> there's just such a joy to watch on screen and like the little things they do, their little stories, the what they're excited about, like their little internal dramas, like that stuff was all amazing, you know, and then oh, and they're killing aliens. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> But I'm extremely excited to do what I think has now become both of our favorite things of yeah. the show yeah. is to play a round of the game. Did I do it well? I didn't no, do it well. It was too. Yeah, it wasn't low enough. I don't think the game. That's, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> 
All right. Well, this so this, just for people who don't know what it is, the game is this thing that Eric Thomas has devised where he challenges us each week with an indie film making quandary, question, situation, debacle. How do you get out of this thing that's happened while you're trying to make your movie? And we've done quite a few of these now, and they're they're never boring. <laughs> they're just always fun. We ask them blind. So this week is Liz's turn to ask the question. She has not heard this question. She doesn't know anything about this question. You know, this is completely new. So here we go. Director, you are on day three of a 20-day shoot. Since pre-production, you and the DP have been butting heads. Ooh. Up until now, it hasn't been an issue, but things have turned for the worse. The DP is starting to show a severe lack of respect for you, your choices, and your process. To make things worse, the crew is starting to follow suit, and you're very concerned this will jeopardize the quality of the film. Do you, A, or 1, hold a come-to-Jesus meeting with the DP and the entire crew and clear out the air, knowing that this could potentially make things worse? <laughs> oh, wow. Let's put it all out there. Schedule a talk with the DP and hope the producers will back you up. Fire the DP and replace them. Throw a party and try to show everyone a good time in the hopes that that will raise spirits and get some of the crew on your side. Or other. What do you do, director? What do you do? Oh, I'd replace that DP. I think that the crew may be turning against me or towards the DP, whichever active or we want to kind of picture it as. <laughs> there are a million reasons why, right? That like a crew may lean towards someone like a DP away from a director. A director is usually the person who has the least amount of experience on the film set where the DP has just years and years and years over or projects and projects and projects more than a director usually does unless the director comes from the world of crewing up. So I, I kind of understand how that sort of mutiny could occur. But that relationship is too valuable. It's too important to me. If anyone knows me, they know I'm obsessed with having a really loving, kind, or at least non-volatile environment on set because I kind of shut down in conflict. So I would be replacing the DP, hopefully with someone who's good on their feet, you know, maybe even someone from the doc world, someone who can work in an improvisational way so that we can catch up as soon as they come on board. And, you know, there's some DPs that like a lot of prep and like a lot. So you have to have to find someone who's more willing to jump right in in the middle of a project. And then I would presume that that DP would be vetted enough that they would get the, they'd either have to bring their own crew or it would be on them to earn the loyalty of the rest of the crew. But this is all to say, I think replacing the DP will solve the problem rather than making the problem bigger by making it a global problem. I think actually it's the DP and me. It's me and the DP, but I'm not going anywhere. So the DP's got to go. <laughs> That's how I see it. <laughs> it's very good. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> well, it's, if it's my film and I originated it, right, and I care about it more than anything, yeah. then I'm going to try to find a way to stay on. What did you think? What are you going to do? Oh, well, it's so funny because it's such like a personal, you know, situation. It's all about like you and the DP having this understanding and agreement going into the movie. And then, yeah, like you going off the rails in the first three days, that would be like the worst case scenario, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like, you know, talking with the DP directly like hopefully you've already done this you know? right, so right, like right maybe it's failed right so like i think you're right like at this point if it really is starting to you know be a thing where they're turning the crew against you and it's like this big deal it's, i think it's too late to talk you know i don't think any talking is going to help so i think you're right i think you have to fire the dp which sucks you know yeah. but it's just i feel like everything that you do in 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 prep preparation to make a movie should help avoid this happening. <laughs> like you should be so intertwined with your cinematographer that like, there's no way that they would ever do anything like this with you, you know, that they would ever pull this, but, but it happens, you know, and I've seen it happen before in a, in smaller, you know, scales basically. And then I've seen it, you know, we've heard it happen before, like similar things like with one of our, our previous guests was talking about. A Jen Page. <laughs> Uh, Jen, yeah. Is that who you think of? Jen Page from Black Magic Collective, 
when she was saying her DP was really disrespectful to her oh, on multiple occasions, not, I think. Not just that one. It was like the, the woman from London. Oh, oh, yeah. Victoria. But it wasn't specifically the DP. It was more like the whole crew in general. And she just like, yeah. like took the reins back like after like a couple days and was like, you know, had all these, these things that she did to like kind of like assert her authority, which was really amazing. Yeah. But yeah, Jim, Jim Page was another one. I mean, it's, I feel like it happens a lot, you know? Yeah. And sadly, it seems to happen a lot to women, which really sucks. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I'm curious, people, other other solutions, other things that you would have done in this situation, you know, or things that you did do in similar situations that worked. We'd love to hear them because this is like definitely a problem that, you know, people will continue to, to, to face, you know, especially... If you're a first time filmmaker, like you said, and like yeah. you don't necessarily have that deep connection to your DP and they're just someone who like is really excited about your project and like everything's looking great on the surface, but you just met them like, you know, a few weeks ago or whatever. It's like it definitely like this could happen. No. So it's I think if this is one of the sacred relationships, it's like me, my DP and me and my editor. I mean, like, yes, producers are really I mean, all all crew members are very important. But like when I'm working with let's say I'm working with Julia Swain. And I work with other DPs now and I love Julie Swain so much, but I like worship her on set. When she does something, I go real loud and I go, God, that's fucking gorgeous. You know, like I want to celebrate her work on set. If you're not at the stage where you are just proud and in awe of what your DP and their team is doing for you, like you're working with the wrong DP. Like they are Mm -hmm. magic makers. Like if you're not looking through the monitor and saying, God, that's gorgeous. You're with the wrong teammate, I think. And like even that can inspire a lot of kindness between director and DP. Just if the director can outwardly appreciate the work of the DP more, where I think that helps. And then yeah, Julia was always like, is always really respectful. Sorry, this is turning into the Julia Swain love hour. But there's something I noticed that she does where she needs an actor to move and she'll go to me and she'll say, can you ask Anne to move a quarter of an inch to her left? You know what I mean? It's like she doesn't, she also is very respectful of the role of a director. I think that's, you need that, right? You need to like stay in your own lane on set. And a lot of people don't know that there are different jurisdictions for different crew members when you're an emerging filmmaker. And I think those trespassing moments is what creates a lot of the tension. But I guess I just want to say like, if you're not absolutely in love with your DP or your editor, what, why are you even working with them? Like there's so many different people who could, who want to be a DP or an editor and like, you got the pick of the litter if you're doing a feature film. There's right. a lot of people well, who want to work on it. That's true. But, you know, there's, it also depends on the area you're in and, and like, you know, who is available, you know, but it's interesting because I've run this into a couple of times where like I've been asked to recommend DPs for features, you know, yeah. and I'm like, why am I, why are we getting, <laughs> like, why is the producer like, you know, finding all these DP options? Shouldn't the director have yeah, like, the people they should they have, want to work with? They should have like a, a, a <laughs> file of like the 15 DPs they've worked with already that they love. Yeah, or, or just like, like the, at least one person who they're like, this is my person that I yes. like, trust and I love. But it feels like there's a lot of people who come into to movie making and that's not their, their chief, f- f- Important. It's not the thing that's most Crazy. important to them. It's like the story is the most important thing. Like the actors are the most important thing. It's like DP. It's like, oh, we just need a DP. No. Like, I can never think that way. That just seems so crazy to me. Yeah. You got it. And like that, uh, that's part of the fun of being on set is seeing what they do and how they command their team. They're the director. They're the director of the, the visuals. They're director of photography. They're up there with you. It's almost, I would say it's basically congruent. And I'm, you know, a director and a producer are looking at different story considerations, different budget considerations. They're protecting relationships with their cast. Like there's a lot of things that are different, but it, it is, it is basically horizontal in terms of power structure on a film. And that's how we should look at it and I feel the same way about my editor I'm like my editor is the storyteller of this film and if I'm not excited by their work then I you shouldn't be working with them you should be very passionate about those people because they're the ones who are going to help you shape the story you know they're your partners and like you said in in storytelling you know it's like your department heads so important I I even go down to like get picky about my gaffer you know I let my DP do that but I I love that you mean obviously get like 
DP sign off, of course, you know, but like there's, there's like, I have a lot of people who I just really like to work with in all the departments. But anyways, that's a good question. It's, it's a tough man. It's a tough thing, but you, you do have to realize like what's better for the project in the end. And if, if that person, if that relationship's not working for whatever reason, yeah, you got to find a new relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're not having any fun on set, that's, I think that was the core of the question that upset me the most. I was just thinking, God, I'm just regretting, like I'm dreading coming to set if this is the situation. And that's not oh, how yeah. it should be. No. But if you have a question similar to Eric's or just a question for us in general, you can send it to us at podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. If you like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes or wherever podcasts are being reviewed. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at MMIH Podcast, YouTube at Making Movies is Hard Podcast. I encourage you to check out Jambox.io, which is a royalty-free music and SFX company with an emphasis on high-quality cinematic cues. Their composers have worked on soundtracks for Hollywood-level films, working with directors like Michael Bay, Martin Scorsese. They've customized plans to fit your needs, which is pretty cool. We want to thank Nyla Inukshuk for coming on the show. Thanks to Tatum Wan from Katrina Wan PR for setting up the interview. Thanks to our editor, Jeff Framut, for being fabulous and doing the editing. Thanks to our producer, Eric Toms, for being wonderful. Thanks to all of you for listening and talk to you next week. Featuring some of their best writers, so head over to ISA Network, to the ISA.org today to sign up for free today. What the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) So head over. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Take two on the ending.